Well, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, this talk today is uh, a talk that I've uh, put together uh, in a group of people who haven't been researched particularly much yet, and yet it's a group of people which a lot of the prominent researchers in osteoarthritis think we should be paying a lot more attention to, and that's these younger people who are getting osteoarthritis, because most of the research, for instance, that I've done in the area of osteoarthritis, I'm dealing with people who are 65, 75 years old, uh, and yet there are many people who are getting their osteoarthritis much younger than that, so in their 40s and 50s. So my brief in this particular talk was to share with you um, our philosophy of our group and some of the techniques that we're using uh, when we do strength work with these people, uh, when we do some balance work and also um, some cardiovascular rehabilitation which we include uh, in our program for these people who are younger with uh, OA of the knee or the ankle joint. So some of the thoughts that I'm uh, going to be sharing with you are research-based, and some of them are really uh, come from come from my own experience and the experience of uh, our group in this particular area. Who am I talking about when I'm saying, well, it's a young group? I'm not talking about 20 or 30 year olds. I'm I'm still looking at people who are in their 40 to 50 years old. But they're people who do have osteoarthritis, which is showing up on radiographs. And we know that for osteoarthritis to show up on uh, radiographs, there's been considerable damage to the articular cartilage already. And some researchers have said <laughs> over 30, 40% of the articular cartilage has gone once we're starting to see it on a radiograph. To give you a, a little bit more of a profile of what these people look like, I've put up some key features that we've noted in a, in a cohort of these people. Um, all of the ones that we've looked at have had notable injuries. So we're really dealing primarily with a group who have post-traumatic osteoarthritis. And when we looked at the particular problems that they had had, it was meniscal damage, they were, some of them were ACL deficient, some of them had had just recurrent ankle sprains, and some of them had uh, had, had malleolar fractures. When we talked to them about their pain, uh, at pain at rest was between zero and two, and uh, it was really when they started doing exercise that they had, again, the same aching pain. And they described it as being exactly that, an aching pain which was stayed relatively level uh, but never turned into a different characteristic, like a sharp pain. There was never any indication in these individuals that there was something neuropathic going on, so we weren't hearing words such as electric shocks, burning, tingling, those sorts of things. It was always uh, a talk of this aching pain that they might have got after, say, 30 minutes of jogging or walking up a mountain or down a mountain, etc., and that might stay with them for two or three days before it started to settle. The way that they often settled it was through medications, and uh, they virtually had an open prescription, we might say, where they got their uh, uh, anti-inflammatories and they could use them as required. And there was a half a dozen of these people who had had a corticosteroid injection into, into the joint. Uh, in terms of their function, their main problem was in these running, climbing type activities. When I say climbing there, I'm thinking also of people who are in occupations who climb ladders and do those types of activities because that was again uh, the type of activity that was bothersome to these people. 30% of these guys still were playing recreational sport and uh, we used the lower limb task questionnaire which um, asked people about uh, their activities of daily living. There's a section there and they got 38 out of 40 meaning that they could do most tasks of daily living pretty well. But when it came to uh, recreational activities, such as jumping, kicking a ball, moving around like that, we see uh, a, a much lesser score there, 30 out of 40. 
And when we look at the radiographs for these people, they were early OA, grade one and two, um, based on the Kelgren Lawrence score. So that gives you just a sort of a, a picture of the people that we are trying to do something other than having them swallow a lot of uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories as the main way that they're dealing with their osteoarthritis. Muscle strength deficits um, form an important part of our program in our older people with arthritis and there's really no reason why they shouldn't with the younger ones as well. And we isokinetically uh, test these people and uh, we do that at 180 degree, uh, degrees per second. And the findings from this particular cohort was concentric deficits of around 23% in those who had knee arthritis, and this is in the quadriceps, and eccentric def uh, deficits which were greater, so around that 28%, and they were generally um, always higher than the concentric, uh, the concentric deficits. We test the guys' uh, ankles, the people who had osteoarthritis of the ankles at a slower speed because uh, it was problematic getting reliable numbers when we went as fast as 180 in these people. Uh, but we uh, again saw deficits of 18 to 20 percent and in eversion and inversion as well we saw um, deficits which were greater and this was a common uh, finding, 24, 26 percent in uh, these individuals. Now the size of these deficits are such that we think uh, it's important you deal with them and you saw the slide this morning where I talked about the fact that if you have muscle deficits in these particular muscles, then you're more likely to get this ground reaction transient where you get a much greater rate of loading at the time of foot strike, and that is going to cause much more stress on already damaged cartilage. And even more importantly, we think, on subchondral bone. And remember, the cartilage is not innovated but subchondral bone is very innovated and has a number of pain receptors in it. And again, our philosophy there or our thoughts are if we can take this away, perhaps this is part of why they're um, complaining when they do these uh, activities, walking and jogging type activities. And similarly, the other reason why we would want to get into the strengthening is because we have evidence from studies such as these studies here that people with uh, quadriceps weakness, for instance, um, will have a greater progression of their OA over two or three uh, years, and that's been measured in terms of the width of the joint space. Now, there's been a recent uh, meta-analysis and systematic review of strength training in people with osteoarthritis, and it's just come out in the last uh, few months or so uh, from an Australian group. And uh, the key point that came uh, from this study was that higher intensity training, training at a greater load, led to better effect sizes in terms of improvements in strength. And the delineating level, if you like, was getting people to train above 70% of their 1RM, so the maximum that they could lift once. If you train them at 70% of that, um, you would get much greater effect sizes up to 0.76, which is uh, getting up to almost being a large effect size, uh, compared to if you train them below that level. And the authors of this paper called this this, this level here, a low intensity type training. This is relatively high in our view and um, we would never start people at this particular level when they strength train. In fact, here's um, what we would typically be doing with them when we start strength training these individuals. We're looking at a 20 reps per set type loading with that individual. So that's going to be down around that 50 uh, to 56, 50 to 60 percent of 1RM compared to the 70 percent that these guys are recommending. And we would uh, be aiming for around 12 reps per set, um, but it's going to be at least four weeks before we start progressing these people towards um, these greater loads that are being recommended. And the reason for that is if we go much faster than that, we will get flare-ups and swelling and inflammation occurring in the knee joint. Uh, we also 
pay more attention to open chain exercises in these individuals with osteoarthritis. And the reason for that is based on work which has examined maximum compressive forces, which are important forces when you're thinking of uh, the articular cartilage. And if you cast your eye over here at the leg press, the squat, and the open chain quadriceps exercises here, you can see that there is decreased or lesser maximal compressive forces going through the joint when you're doing open chain exercises. So we will uh, work these more than we would these types of exercises. In addition uh, to that, in we will also start our exercises with these people often not going through a full range between say zero and 100 degrees when we're doing this um, type of strength training. And again, our philosophy on this is based around the, compl the compressive loading. And if you look at this graph here and you can think of a person with their knee out straight and then that knee is flexing under load and then they're extending their knee again, the key point to look at it, the graph is on the edges here between say 10 degrees and out to 45 degrees, you can see there's much less compressive force going through the joint than if you get it going out to 90 to 100 degrees. So we will often start people in these ranges uh, in an effort to keep the joint from being flared up um, in the early times. Our typical reps and sets four sets and we're working on twice per week in our training sessions and to remedy a 30% deficit in the muscles that I've been talking about this will take around 10 to 12 weeks with this particular regime. Now once we have sorted out the strength and we've got our strength under 10% in terms of a deficit from left to right side. Um, we do look at power in these younger individuals because some of them are wanting to continue playing sports, um, social soccer, um, those types of activities. And uh, there's also been studies which have pointed at power actually being more correlated to functional activity, the ability to do functional activities compared to maximal strength. Now there's been a lot of, uh, let's say, discussion in the literature concerning what's the best way to train power and some of the original researchers in this area used animal models and argued that you should be working at say around 30% of one's MVC. Some of our own work in this area has suggests that you should be working around 60 or 70 percent of an MVC to get the greatest power output during training. But another notion which came from uh, Bosco from many years ago is that it doesn't really matter so much the loading level, it's the speed at which the person is working the weight. So as an example, imagine me just pushing out here and doing a bench press and I've got a load of say maybe 40% of 1RM on. Think about doing a bench press, a bit of Nicola's mental practice. Is that what? <laughs> no, 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 you don't have to get up. <laughs> Think about what he was saying before. Imagine going as fast as you possibly can. Remember that often you can go for two or three repetitions and then suddenly you slow down. And what Bosco suggested is that's when you should stop. So you set up your load, it might be at 30%, it might be at 50%, but the rule is go as fast as you can and when the velocity of movement suddenly decreases because you get that point in which suddenly you can't move the bar or the dumbbell, whatever it is, as fast, you stop at that point and you have a rest. And that's thought to be, uh, that's a regime that we are using with these individuals um, and we find it doesn't flare the joint up um, and we're getting reasonable results. Now, I talked about this this morning and the same rules that I applied uh, uh, 
talked about this morning in regard to injury apply here, particularly as we've got damaged cartilage, um, which we want to take care of. And there is going to be swelling, and it's going to often be small-scale swelling, which is perennial. It's there a lot of the time. But you still need to pay attention to it and put in some of the strategies that Nicola talked about and I talked about early on today. Now, when we do our strength training, we have followed for a number of years with our older patients, our 60 and 70 or, and even older, in the rest break between sets, we use what athletes um, say as a combined or coaches say as a combined type regime. So there's not a, a moment where you stop and you chat we actually get the person might be doing the leg press, such as you see here, and they might have been doing the horizontal leg press, and then they get up and they do jumping activities immediately. Or they get up and they do some dynamic balance type activities immediately, and then they go back to their set. They still get the same amount of time for the muscle to replenish the stores of energy that it needs. So it's about that two to three minutes that we're wanting them to have as a rest, but they're doing exercise as opposed to having a yarn with the person next door to them or having a chat to the person next door. Balance is another area that we pay a lot of attention to in these younger patients. And uh, we, were, we didn't always do this, but we were alerted to it uh, by a study by Hubbard. And he had the most interesting findings in that he put people who had grade 1 and 2 osteoarthritis of the ankle on a force plate and he just wanted them to stand there and he was going to measure sway. None of them. None of them in the group could stand on one leg at all. So he had to run his experiment. He published the research with these people standing on two legs. And the results still came out in regard to comparison with a group of individuals who did not have OA and that there was greater sway going on in these individuals who had osteoarthritis of the ankle joint. We also um, use force plates, and we have a technique where people might walk up to the plate and then they've got to stop on the plate, and often we just say, stop, now. And then we look at how long it takes them to be steady. And here are some of our findings in this area, and I've included not only the knee and ankle here, but also the findings in terms of time to steadiness when you've got hip arthritis, knee arthritis, ankle arthritis, which is the worst, and here's a group of controls who can come to a stop and be relatively steady very quickly. So we think this is important in terms of increasing or improving the person's ability to move and create less damage to their articular cartilage if they're doing more of this type of training and neuromuscular training within their uh, overall rehabilitation program. A number of people um, often ask whether we brace our people and uh, we look, we have the luxury of course being in a laboratory at a university that I can look at proprioception and position sense, etc. And some of our previous work in this area has looked at just simple little woven braces that are made of cloth, so or neoprene. Very simple things, nothing fancy with a lot of metal on it or anything like that. And we've looked at individuals who have been very poor in proprioception or position sense. So they might have errors such as you see here of six degrees when we do a position matching task at the ankle and the knee. And if you're not sure what I'm talking about here, imagine I bend my arm here, I've got a blindfold on, I'm, I stop, I go back to the start position, and then I've got to find where I was in space. Well, we do this type of experiment down in the ankle and the knee joint, etc. But our findings in regard to bracing are before you here. If you look at the green bars, this is unbraced, and this is people who are already very good at this task. And you see, putting on a brace 
makes virtually no difference at all to these guys. Yet, if an individual has a lot of proprioceptor or poor position sense at the start, putting on the brace certainly makes a difference to those individuals. So we see a nice improvement there of about 25%. But it's a, you've got to be aware that you're going to get the best result from uh, a brace if you're using it um, to improve proprioceptive awareness if a person is already poor at the task. Now, cardiovascular fitness is a huge problem in older people with osteoarthritis because, of course, you've got this cycle of damage going on and they don't want to get up off the couch and go and exercise. And as a result of that, they're much more likely to get uh, cardiovascular problems, increased blood pressure, diabetes type 2. These types of things are going to be or are more often seen in these individuals. We tested a group of younger people, so these 40 to 50 year olds, we had nine of them agree to come into the lab and uh, do a maximum VO2 test for us. And their mean age was 46 and they had the same parameters as those people I mentioned at the start of the study. Uh, in fact, they were part of those. Now, on the x-axis here, you see the subjects, nine of these subjects here. And on the y-axis, you see maximum oxygen uptake. Um, we went to as far as they could possibly go. And this green bar here is what's regarded as normal. Okay, so this would be an average score for individuals with no pathology at all. And you can see some of our people get there who have got the arthritis, but note that there are individuals, in fact nearly half of the cohort are needing cardiovascular work, and these are people in their 40s. The other thing to note here also is note the BMI. It's starting to creep up. And you've got people with a 27 here, um, which is not far off being called overweight uh, down in New Zealand. So what do we do with these people? Again, cardiovascular type work demands that you do work on the limb over a period of time and it can be with interval training or continuous. How do you go about putting that in place? Well, this is how we do it. In the first month that we start this sort of training off with these individuals, we're working on three times a week and they do 20 minutes of exercise and we don't mind what they do. They can get on the exercise cycle in our gym, they can get on the cross trainer or they can go and run in the pool. And there's um, some recent workouts saying uh, that running in the pool at chest height decreases load on the ankle joint and the hip joint by about 40% compressive forces on the knee joint. So we don't do any of the other hydrotherapy stuff at all. We simply get them in there and the instruction is running. And this is what we do with these guys for a month. And essentially we're just tuning them into the activity again and getting some nice aerobic training started. Some of these people certainly want to go back to running because they want to go and play football again, etc. And it's not till the second month that we would start working with these guys. And what we do with them is a regime that we have used for a number of years in our ACL rehabilitation uh, reconstruction, um, rehabilitation sessions, I guess you'd say when people are ready to start jogging again. And it's a session or a series of sessions that we like because we know it does not cause an increase in swelling and we know that it does not change the size or the number of bone marrow lesions because we've measured it with 
MRI before and after these sessions. So again, it's a typical four sessions, 20 minutes over seven days, a day's rest in between, and it's this one minute of jogging, two minutes of walking for a total of 20 minutes, and then one minute of jogging, one minute of walking, and then reversing things, they're into a bit more jogging, less walking, and then by six, session four, they're into continuous uh, running. We find if we've done that month first, with off their feet, so to speak, but using the same cyclic motion, and then they shift to this, we have much less in the way of flares uh, going on in terms of inflammation in the joint or increased discomfort. What is the intensity that we're working at with these individuals? Typically, we are wanting them to be working at around 60%, and that's where we start them off, and we don't take them that much higher than that during their training. Um, and if you're wanting to do that in a clinical practice type situation, it's often really good to use your uh, perceived exertion questionnaires and uh, if you're using those working in an area where uh, a person is saying I'm working moderately hard is where we want to, uh, these people to be. We also inform them or give them um, some informal strategies um, for improving their cardiovascular fitness. And these are just simple things that we tell them uh, once we find out a bit more about their work. Get off at an earlier stop if you use the bus. You know, if you take the car to work, park a block away. Take the stairs, not the lift. All of these things add up and make a difference to the cardiovascular um, fitness in the long run. It's important when you get into the cardiovascular work with these guys that you make sure they are using good shoes, shock absorbing shoes. Now if you'd asked me this question 10 to 15 years ago, um, I would have been a lot fussier in the choice of shoes that I would recommend to people. But these days Asics and Nike and New Balance and all the major brands have such fabulous material in their shoes that it's really the individual who comes to you with shoes from a discount type shop um, that you've got to talk to about getting better shoes. And they just need to go for what is ever comfortable across you know, those major brands who have put a lot of time into the shock absorbing and the motion control, etc. And you can make a big difference to this ground reaction transient by having a person in a good pair of shoes as compared to um, these ones from the discount stores. Again, it makes uh, a big difference to the heel strike transient here if a person does their exercise, their cardiovascular exercise on grass or a softer surface compared to concrete. And in fact, there's evidence in the animal literature, some of Raiden's early work, which was done in sheep, where he made sheep walk on concrete for a few months and then compared the, those animals to animals that had walked in the pasture. And he showed that there was quite notable stiffening in the subchondral bone of those animals that had walked on the concrete and therefore there was much less absorption of energy uh, associated with the ground reaction forces and much more energy was being transmitted through to the articular cartilage and as a result of that was more likely to be doing more damage there. We certainly give them instructions in terms of landing from jumps, those people who are in construction, building, etc., and all those, those people also who are playing sports that involve that. One of the interesting things that we've noted um, over time is that when there is muscle weakness in these individuals, we notice that hip and knee flexion is decreased when they're doing these types of jumping activities. And yet the classic work that was done 20 years ago shows very clearly, uh, McNick Gray's work for instance, that you decrease your ground reaction forces in the best and most effective way if there's lots of motion going on at the knee and at the hip when an individual lands. 
And furthermore, that there's a lot of eccentric muscle activation going on. And as you saw earlier on, that's one of the big problems in regard to these individuals. Hence um, the need to focus on that. It's worth noting also that if a person is on anti-inflammatory drugs and they're not on a steady regime, we have found that what happens is um, there's a tendency to do more because there's no pain. And there's literature which has shown exactly that as well. For instance, a study here which showed that individuals in a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory trial ended up having increased damage in their knee joints because they had no perception of the loading or much less perception. So the take-home point here is even though the drugs are working or the steroids working, it's important that they still maintain the level of activity that is keeping the knee from flaring up and they don't try and do more. Essentially, you're putting in place a program that doesn't cause flare-ups and the anti-inflammatory is doesn't need to work um, as hard and often they don't need as much um, for um, to have the same discomfort. I'm nearly there, guys. It's um, My focus has been in this talk about the physical elements of doing exercise. And uh, it's been about sets and reps and loads and um, how often you do these things. But we've got to remember there's more to exercise than that. And this was pointed out very nicely by Maley in uh, a study which looked at self-efficacy in individuals with osteoarthritis. And self-efficacy is about having the confidence to actually do exercise. And that actually explained a moderate proportion of a person's ability to do running and jumping activities, etc. So it's important to be aware of the person's psychology and to communicate well and get a feel for where they're at in terms of their confidence. Nearly there, last slide. We have look at depression in all our osteoarthritic people, our older folks, and when we look at these younger individuals, we don't see it at all. We've, there might have been one or two in the 28 or 30 of younger ones that were just reaching the threshold where you, where you might say they had some depression going on. But that's much less than the older people that we see. So we don't think that it's a problem. But where I think we have got a psychological issue going on with these individuals is when they go to their own doctor. We call them a general practitioner. Do you, is that what you call them here? Because those guys will order up the x-ray and lo and behold, there's some osteoarthritis. And they say to the patient, you know, you've got osteoarthritis. There's nothing we can do about this. And you're going to get a little bit more pain and it's going to get worse and you've just got to live with this. And when it gets bad enough, I'll send you to the orthopedic surgeon and he'll put in a new joint for you. And that is not what they should be doing because we are so valuable as physiotherapists and it's been shown over and over again that exercise and the other elements that we do as physiotherapists can make an enormous difference to these person, people. Now the problem I have, I can give these individuals a really cool program and I can decrease their pain and I can decrease their function and then it uh, increase their function. And then I ask them often at the end of the program, which might be six months when they're off by themselves, etc. I say to them, well, are you still going to have that total joint replacement? Guess what the answer is? Of course. They have been, I don't know, hypnotized that that is the route for osteoarthritis. And hence, I think it's very important that we liaise, we put in front of the doctors the evidence for what we can do. 
because I'm quite convinced we can do an awful lot for these individuals and it's these young guys that we've got to be really working hard for because think about it, 40 years old and you've got moderate osteoarthritis, that's a long time to be living with constant pain every time you walk at a level of four. Okay, here's the last slide. Key points, strength and neuromuscular training are important to rehabilitation in these younger people with osteoarthritis. And uh, we believe that uh, these r deficits that we see of over 20%, they're not going to go away in a week or two. They require weeks of training, and the reason for that is you don't want those flare-ups. You don't want that AMI creeping in if you can possibly uh, avoid it, and hence we take a lot more care with these individuals. The adaptations that we see, of course, when we train these individuals will be neural as well as morphological. There's a basic steps there for the training program, and I talked about that. Remember the cardiovascular training. I think there's a little bit of evidence there from our cohort. It, well, for me, it was enough to make sure that I check and I do a submaximal test and I run the courses I run in this area. I show people how to do that. And they put in place a cardiovascular program in those individuals who are not scoring up to where they should be for their age. Remember that your program of exercises has got to simulate the important activities that these individuals do in their daily lives. And then we have this slogan that Arthritis New Zealand used for many years called use it or lose it. And that means that once they've left you, they can't just stop. This is a lifelong thing for them. They may not have to work as hard and as regularly as they did when they were with you and you were looking after them, but they do need to keep going. And hence, you need to book them in at periodic intervals to see how they're going, to give them that booster, if you like, to keep them on the right track. Thanks very much for your attention.